will be, uh, be starting here momentarily, uh, waiting for our ranking member. And just a housekeeping note before I bring it to order is our goal is to uh, allow uh, the ranking member and me to do opening statements and try to do all four of your opening statements uh, before then, um, probably at, uh, racing over to the floor for one or two votes as a natural break and then come back. And then we'll have uh, plenty of opportunity before the next series to do questions and engagement with, with each other. So uh, that's, that's the plan. Hopefully the schedule as it's been laid out, the floor schedule will allow uh, us to follow that path. So. Today's hearing of the Subcommittee on Government Organization Efficiency and Financial Management will come to order. I certainly thank uh, everyone for being here today, both witnesses and guests, and uh, my ranking member, Mr. Towns, from New York. Our hearing today focuses on two key issues at the Internal Revenue Service. First, our hearing will address the tax gap between what people owe in Federal taxes and what the IRS ultimately collects. Second, the hearing will review the increasing problem of identity theft-related tax fraud. Federal taxes make up about 96 percent of the government's total revenues each year. Because of this, it is very important that the IRS is able to effectively collect taxes and enforce Federal policy. The majority of Americans pay their taxes voluntarily and on time. But every year there is a gap between the amount of Federal taxes owed and the amount of the IRS collects. Earlier this year, the IRS released its most recent analysis on the tax gap using data from the 2006 tax year. That data shows a $450 billion gap between taxes owed and taxes voluntarily paid. IRS recovered approximately $65 billion of this amount, making the net tax gap $385 billion. According to the National Taxpayer Advocate, the average household must pay approximately $3,400 or more for the government to raise the same revenue it would have collected if everyone paid their taxes in full. There are many causes of the tax gap, including intentional underreporting, failing to file taxes, or math errors on those taxes that are filed. Because of this, we need a multifaceted approach to achieve an effective and appropriate response and to close the tax gap. Using third-party information to verify tax returns could increase voluntary compliance. The Treasury Department has recommended increasing penalties for people who purposely do not comply with Federal tax law, especially egregiously, uh, maybe more so repeatedly, failing to comply. Simplifying the Federal tax code could also help by making it easier to file taxes and reducing the opportunity to commit willful tax evasion. We will hear more from our witness today about solutions how we can close the tax, uh, how to close the tax gap and better serve all of our taxpayers. This hearing will also address identity theft related tax fraud. Identity theft affects thousands, as we are learning, more and more hundreds of thousands of taxpayers each year and has a significant impact on its victims. Identity thieves often steal personal information from taxpayers, including names, social security numbers, and addresses. With this information, the thieves can file fraudulent tax returns with the IRS and receive the refunds that are owed to the legitimate taxpayer. Victims may not even know they have had their identity and tax returns stolen until they go to file their own return and IRS notifies them that somebody has already filed on their behalf, fraudulently filed on their behalf. 
It can often take months for IRS to resolve these cases and issue refunds to the legitimate taxpayer, the victim of the crime. Identity theft-related tax fraud is a serious and rapidly growing problem that has been the focus of two prior hearings of this subcommittee. While significant work is being done to address this problem, and I certainly commend the IRS for their efforts, we must do more to protect taxpayers from criminals who steal their identities and their refunds and do harm to not just that individual victim, but also to America and the hard-earned tax dollars of lawful citizens. Just this week, authorities reported that a man working for a health care nonprofit stole the identities of more than 50 brain injury patients to steal funds from the American people through fraudulent returns. The American people deserve a government that protects the taxes they pay and fairly and equitably enforces the law. We need solutions to ensure that honest taxpayers are not unduly burdened because others do not pay their share. We must also work to reduce identity theft and prevent it before payments are issued to criminals. Today we are joined by four experts regarding these issues who have extensive knowledge about the problems that exist within the Federal tax system. I look forward to the testimony of our witnesses and to continuing to work with each of them and all partners, including here within the subcommittee, to better prevent tax fraud and fairly administer the tax code. With that, I yield to um, the previous chairman of the full committee and the ranking member of the subcommittee um, and previous chairman of the subcommittee, uh, my good friend and colleague from New York, Mr. Towns, for the purpose of an opening statement. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank um, uh, the witnesses as well. I think this is a very timely hearing. Uh, this is the third hearing in a series held by this committee examining how the IRS handles the growing problem of identity theft and tax fraud. As of March the 3rd, 2012, the IRS had already identified over 440,000 tax returns with 2.7 billion claim and fraudulent refunds. Fortunately, IRS screening prevented 70, now 97 percent of those fraudulent claims from being paid. Today, the IRS is doing a better job of protecting the taxpayer and the Treasury from criminals than ever before, and we salute you for that. But more is required of us to stay ahead of the criminals and to help the victims. One of the first priorities we must address is the quality of assistance given to taxpayers victimized by employment or tax refund fraud. The Inspector General does not paint a pretty picture of how the IRS will be able to handle this problem going forward. It seems as if taxpayers will have fewer walk-in help centers with shorter business hours and longer hold time on the phone, phone with IRS agents. Budget cuts are the primary reason, but I hope we can find alternate solutions to these issues. Today we will also focus on the $450 billion tax gap. This tax gap equals nearly 20 percent of our forecasted deficit for this fiscal year. We simply cannot afford to look the other way and just not do anything. Part of the tax gap is the result of tax cheats who simply refuse to comply with the law which increases burdens on the rest of us, but a portion is due to taxpayers' confusion and unintentional errors as well. I am sure that we can all agree that the tax code is extremely complex. This complexity makes it hard for taxpayers who honestly want to pay their taxes to figure out what they actually owe and as a result, they can accidentally overpay or underpay. We must do more to understand the sources of the tax gap and compliance burdens so we can make pro progress in covering new creative solutions. We cannot close the tax gap by enforcement against the average American who is doing their best to comply with the tax laws. We all have to share the burden and do more. And let us work to reform our tax code in a way that will help us collect more of the taxes that are owed 
but not paid. And let us continue our work to make the tax code more fair and simple. In order to do that, we must work together. I thank our witnesses today, Inspector General Miller, uh, Mr. White, <coughs> Ms. Olson, for your appearance here uh, today, Mr. George. I thank all of you uh, for being here. And I look forward to the testimony with great anticipation. Uh, we need to make certain that um, people are protected, and that is our obligation and responsibility to do it. And I think, think that working together, we can do a lot better than what we're doing. This is not a committee here to blame you and you blame us. This is a committee to come up with some solutions. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. And I uh, would uh, echo your final comment there as well, that um, you know, we are about working with you and all to solve problems, not to play gotcha. And uh, all the more we appreciate our witnesses being here with us today. Uh, we will keep the record open for seven days for any additional statements uh, or extraneous materials to be submitted for the record. Uh, we are now glad to move to our witnesses. And uh, we are honored to have four very dedicated public servants who uh, day in and day out uh, seek to serve the American people with great distinction and honor and uh, who bring great expertise to the benefit of, of the subcommittee today. So we thank each of you for being here. We are honored to have uh, Mr. Stephen Miller, Deputy Commissioner of Service and Enforcement at the Internal Revenue Service, Ms. Nina Olson, National Taxpayer Advocate, the Honorable J. Russell George, Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration and Mr. James White, Director of Strategic Issues at the United States Government Accountability Office. Again, we thank each of you for being here. Um, we have had a chance to review your written testimony and appreciate your submitting that ahead of time. It allows me to go through, and I am famous for my blue marker and making notes of things I want to try to get to in the time we will have. Um, but uh, we do appreciate having that in advance and welcome your testimony today. If we can try to stay to about the five-minute window, uh, and that hopefully will allow us again to go through all of your opening statements before running to the floor for votes and then coming back for questions. So, Commissioner Miller, if, uh, if you would like to begin. Uh, I apologize. Um, if I could ask all four of you to stand pursuant to our committee rules, I need to swear, uh, swear you uh, in. If you could stand and raise your right hand. Do you, so I'm sorry. Uh, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. you. May be seated and let the record reflect that all four witnesses affirmed the oath. Uh, we will now begin with Commissioner Miller. You are recognized. Uh, Chairman Platts, Ranking Member Towns, uh, my name is Steve Miller, as you have mentioned, Deputy Commissioner of the Internal Revenue Service. I appreciate the opportunity to testify on the tax gap today and also to update the subcommittee on our identity theft work this filing season. The tax gap is the difference between the amount of tax owed by taxpayers for a given year and the amount that is paid voluntarily and on time. The amount includes the complete spectrum of behavior, from confusion to fraud. The tax gap analysis itself is best seen as a directional tool to provide insights into areas where noncompliance exists and the means by which we can impact compliance. As better explained in my written testimony, our work shows that compliance is most prevalent where there is withholding and or third party reporting. The IRS recently received an updated tax gap study covering the tax year 2006, which shows that the Nation's compliance rate for that year is a little over 83 percent. This is essentially unchanged from the last review covering tax year 2001. The report also showed that the net tax gap in dollars for 2006 was $385 billion. The tax gap is comprised of three components, underreporting, nonfiling, and underpayment, of which underreporting is by far the largest. As indicated, the largest parts of the underreporting category are where there is little withholding or third party reporting. In our view, any discussion on how to reduce the tax gap must consider three guiding principles. First, both unintentional taxpayer error and intentional taxpayer evasion must be addressed. Thus, both enforcement and service are necessary. Second, Different sources of noncompliance require different approaches. And third, any major attempt to address the tax gap by legislation, regulation, or through increased enforcement must be considered within a context that fully recognizes taxpayer burden and taxpayer rights. In keeping with these principles, our strategy involves not only increasing enforcement activities, but also educating taxpayers about their tax obligations, 
improving customer service in order to make it easier for individuals and businesses to get the help they need to meet their filing requirements, reducing opportunities for tax evasion, expanding compliance research, and improving information technology. With respect to enforcement, the IRS is making significant headway in increasing tax compliance. Over the last decade, tax collections have gone up significantly and audit rates have risen. But some of these gains are deteriorating as our budget atrophies. Thus, we would ask for your support for our 2013 budget. We believe the best way to impact the tax gap is through a combination of responsible discussions on legislative change and responsible investments in the IRS. Turning now to identity theft. In November, I testified before the subcommittee and described our ongoing work. In my written testimony today, I provided an update on IRS actions. What you will see is that we have implemented the many initiatives we outlined in November. As before, our approach is two-pronged. First, we need to stop false refunds before they get out. Second, we need to help those who have been victimized. We are, in fact, stopping much more refund fraud generally and identity theft specifically. We have put various new identity theft screening filters in place to improve our ability to spot false returns before they are processed and before a refund is issued. The numbers are in my testimony, and I am obviously more than willing to discuss any questions that you have in a particular area. On our work with victims, we have trained 35,000 of our employees to recognize and be sensitive to identity theft. We have also expanded a program for identity protection personnel, personal identification numbers, or IP pins. For the 2012 filing season, we issued IP pins to over 250,000 ID theft victims, which will allow unfettered filing for 2012 for those individuals. We continue to increase staffing to assist identity theft victims, and we are revising and streamlining our process to determine who the real taxpayer is when duplicate filings occur. Again, I will say that we are not done, but we have made real progress in the area. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my oral testimony. I would be more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Commissioner Miller. Ms. Olson. Chairman Platt, Ranking Member Towns, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to de testify today about the subjects of the tax gap and tax-related identity theft. Both of these issues present challenges to tax administration. Regarding the tax gap, the IRS recently released an updated tax gap estimate of 385 net tax gap estimate of 385 billion in 2006 and the size of this estimate has understandably attracted considerable attention. There are many causes of noncompliance including difficulty understanding and complying with the law, inability to pay due to financial hardships and deliberate understatements of tax. I believe the complexity of the tax code is responsible for a considerable considerable portion of noncompliance, and I have repeatedly recommended in my reports to Congress that you all simplify the code. While you are working on that, and I am ever the optimist in that regard, that there are other steps that can be taken. First, the IRS should be given the resources to substantially improve its taxpayer services. The percentage of calls the IRS answers, known as the level of service, has been declining in recent years. For the year to date, about one out of every three calls seeking to reach an IRS representative hasn't gotten through. When taxpayers have managed to get through, taxpayers have waited an average of about 14 minutes on hold. The IRS is also behind in timely processing taxpayer correspondence, with the percentage of letters classified as overage at nearly half of all correspondence by the end of fiscal year 2011. There is no doubt in my mind but that some taxpayers give up in frustration or anger when they find nobody is home and simply don't file or pay. This state of affairs may cause the tax gap to increase by, cause, by converting formerly compliant taxpayers into noncompliant ones simply because the IRS doesn't timely pick up the phone or look at its mail. Second, while the IRS will never be the government's most popular agency, I believe its funding level should be substantially increased. Overall, the IRS is an extraordinary investment. On a budget of $12.1 billion, it collected $2.4 trillion in tax revenue last year, bringing in about $200 for every dollar invested. Yet the Congressional budget rules generally require that the IRS be funded like all other spending programs, with no direct credit given for the funds the IRS brings in. That makes little sense. 
In my view, simplifying the tax code, improving taxpayer service, and giving the IRS sufficient funds to expand its enforcement programs in the proper way would go a long way toward maximizing the tax compliance. Regarding tax-related identity theft, the IRS has made significant progress in these, this area in recent years, including adopting many of my office's recommendations. Notwithstanding these efforts, it is clear that combating identity theft continues to pose significant challenges for the IRS. Three points deserve particular emphasis. First, the IRS should continue to work with the Social Security Administration to restrict public access to the death master file. Second. I am aware that some State and local law enforcement agencies would like access to taxpayer return information to help combat identity theft. I have significant concerns about loosening taxpayer privacy protections and believe this is an area where we need to tread carefully. But as I describe in my written statement, the IRS is developing a procedure that would enable taxpayers to consent to the release of their returns in appropriate circumstances. In my view, giving taxpayers a choice strikes the appropriate balance. Lastly, I note that even as the IRS is being urged to do much more to combat identity theft, taxpayers are clamoring for the IRS to process returns and issue refunds more quickly. While there is still room for the IRS to make improvements in both areas, the two goals are fundamentally at odds. If our overriding goal is to process tax returns and ta deliver tax refunds as quickly as possible for the vast majority of persons who file legitimate tax returns, it is inevitable that some identity thieves will get away with refund fraud and some honest taxpayers will be harmed. On the other hand, if we decide to place a greater value on protecting taxpayers against identity theft and the Treasury against fraudulent refund claims, the IRS will need more time to review returns and the roughly 110 million taxpayers who receive refunds will have to wait longer to get them, perhaps considerably longer. Alternatively, the IRS will require a considerably larger staff to enable it to review questionable returns more quickly. There is no way around these tradeoffs. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today and would be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Ms. Olson. Uh, Inspector General George. Uh, thank you, Chairman Platts, Ranking Member Towns, Mr. Connolly. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the tax gap and the efforts by the Internal Revenue Service to enforce compliance with the tax code. My comments will also address the growing risk of identity theft and tax fraud. In January 2012, the IRS released updated estimates of the tax gap for tax year 2006, which indicated that the Nation's 83 percent voluntary compliance rate was essentially unchanged from prior estimates. The IRS estimated that the gross tax gap increased from $345 billion to $450 billion, as was indicated uh, by Mr. Miller. My written statement includes a, ta a table that shows the comparison between the prior and current tax gap estimates. As also stated earlier, the IRS reports that the gross tax gap is comprised of three primary components, again, $376 billion in underreporting of tax liabilities, $28 billion due to non-filing of tax returns, and $46 billion in underpayment of tax liabilities. The IRS reported that the growth in the tax gap from tax year 2001 to 2006 was concentrated in the underreporting and underpayment forms of noncompliance, which jointly account for more than 9 out of 10 tax gap dollars. The IRS also reported that the tax gap is caused by both unintentional taxpayer errors, whether due to tax law complexity, confusion, or carelessness and willful tax evasion or cheating. The IRS needs to overcome institutional impediments to more effectively address the tax gap. These impediments refer to the established policies, practices, technologies, or business requirements that add unintended course or are no longer optimal given today's society. We are tick to believe the current institutional impediments the IRS faces can point the way to improved opportunities namely, address incomplete compliance research, reassess insufficient compliance strategies, determine how best to fix incomplete document matching programs, and find a way to handle the insufficient enforcement resources. Every year, more than one-half of all taxpayers pay someone else to prepare their Federal tax returns. 
Third party reporting and transparency is crucial to high compliance among individual taxpayers. Basis reporting associated with the buying and selling of securities was an area that needed third party reporting based on previous studies that showed low levels of compliance. The new merchant card reporting requirements were established in 2011. They provide third party reporting data on business receipts for the first time making it much easier for the IRS to identify businesses that are either under-reporting receipts or not reporting at all. Globalization of the U.S. economy has been a major trend for many years. The scope and complexity of the international financial system creates significant enforcement challenges for the IRS. The IRS continues to be challenged by a lack of information reporting on many cross-border transactions. The misclassification of millions of employees as independent contractors is a nationwide problem that continues to grow and contribute to the $72 billion underreporting employment tax gap. TICTOR identified more than 74,000 taxpayers who may have avoided paying approximately $26 million in Social Security and Medicare taxes in 2008. TICTA has continued to assess the IRS's efforts to identify and prevent identity theft. Unscrupulous individuals are stealing identities at an alarming rate for use in submitting tax returns with false income and withholding documents. For processing year 2011, the IRS reported that it detected 940,000 tax returns involving identity theft and prevented the issuance of fraudulent tax refunds totaling $6.5 billion. The amount of fraudulent tax refunds IRS detects and prevents is substantial. The IRS does not know how many identity thieves are filing fictitious tax returns and how much revenue is being lost resulting from the issuance of fraudulent tax refunds. We have found that the issuance of fraudulent tax refunds based on false income documents goes beyond the amount detected and prevented by the IRS. An upcoming report will provide further uh, data. Access to third-party income and withholding information at the time tax returns are processed is the single most important tool the IRS could have to identify and prevent tax fraud. Chairman Platts, Ranking Member Towns, thank you for the opportunity to share my views. Thank you, Inspector General George. Uh, Mr. White. Chairman Platts, Ranking Member Towns, and members of the subcommittee, I am pleased to be here to discuss the tax gap, ID theft-based fraud, and how to reduce them. Uh, the gross tax, summarized on tables paid on pages 4 and 5 of my statement, uh, as you have heard, was recently estimated by our IRS to be $450 billion for tax year 2006. This is the amount the taxpayers should have paid but did not pay on time. Note that this is the amount unpaid for just one year. Of this, IRS estimates, as you have heard, that it will ultimately collect $65 billion from its enforcement actions and from late payments by taxpayers, leaving a net gap of $385 billion. One piece of context is that the tax gap has persisted at about the same level as a percent of total tax liability for decades this despite a myriad of congressional and IRS efforts to reduce it. Key for thinking about how to reduce the tax gap is understanding its nature. The tax gap is spread across various types of taxes, taxpayers, and taxpayer behavior. Most of the tax gap is for the individual income tax, but the corporate income tax and employment tax are also significant contributors. Much of the tax gap is due to misreporting of business income, even for the individual income tax, but non-business income also contributes. Even for a certain category of taxpayer, there is a variety of misreporting behavior. For example, in a recent report, we found that sole proprietors misreport both their receipts and their expenses and some of each is unintentional, while some is intentional. At one level, as you have heard, the cause of the tax gap is easy to understand. Income subject to withholding and or information reporting by, to IRS by third parties, such as employers or banks, has low misreporting. Only about 1 percent of wage income with withholding is misreported. On the other hand, 56 percent of rent, royalty, and sole proprietor income with little or no information reporting is misreported. There are opportunities to reduce the tax gap. 
but because of the variety of noncompliance, multiple approaches will be needed. No single approach is likely to fully and cost effectively address the tax gap. Opportunities include more third party information reporting. Third party reports to IRS about a taxpayer's income allow IRS to easily verify through computer matching and without an audit that the taxpayer's return is accurate. As I already noted, compliance is high when income is reported by third parties such as employers or banks. The challenge with increasing third party reporting is identifying new third parties. They must have knowledge of taxpayers' income or expenses and have tolerable reporting costs. Also, IRS must be able to enforce the reporting requirements so, for example, a small number of reporting entities like banks can be an advantage. The problem is that most third parties that meet these requirements are already required to report. Another opportunity is improving ta service to taxpayers. Service has declined. For example, wait time to get through to an IRS telephone assister has been around 16 minutes this year. The model of human assisters responding to taxpayers may not be sustainable given its high cost. Different strategies for answering taxpayer questions, such as on the IRS website or through paid tax preparers or tax preparation software, will be needed. Another opportunity is additional resources. With tight budgets, if IRS's efforts to innovate don't keep up with workload growth, then the risk is that enforcement and with it voluntary compliance will go down. That could snowball. If taxpayers lose faith in the fairness of the system, they could become less willing to comply themselves. Another opportunity is increasing pre-refund compliance checks. Doing more computerized checks before refunds are issued could reduce improper payments and might also limit refund fraud based on ID theft. Leveraging external resources. Such resources include paid preparers, tax software companies, and whistleblowers. We have made recommendations to help IRS leverage all three to reduce the tax gap. Modernized information systems. Such systems can route phone calls to help taxpayers get the answers they need and support IRS's enforcement staff with timely access to data. Simplifying the tax code, which has also been discussed. Simplification can make it easier for taxpayers who want to comply, do so successfully, and make it harder for those intentionally trying to evade their tax obligations to hide from IRS. In closing, I want to highlight the value of research on the nature and causes of the tax gap. Such research is costly, but without it, Congress and IRS are left struggling to reduce the tax gap without a fact-based understanding of its causes. Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, this concludes my statement. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. White. Again, thank all four of you. And uh, uh, perfect timing. The clock's at zero on the floor, uh, so I'm going to run over, and uh, Mr. Towns, Mr. Connolly, and I will return uh, very quickly as soon as the uh, vote is concluded, and then we will get into uh, questions uh, with you and uh, appreciate your testimony. So uh, this hearing uh, stands in recess to the call of the Chair.